Good morning and Shabbat Shalom and welcome. This is Valley Beth Shalom, Torah study for a Shabbos morning. I'm Rabbi Ed Feinstein, joined this morning by my teacher and friend, Rabbi Mark Gelman. Delight, delightful to have you here, Mark. Highly smiley. In a good mood. And welcome, welcome, everyone. It is a beautiful spring morning and we're delighted to have you together with us this morning. Now, this morning in the Torah, we're reading from the last two parshiot of the book of Leviticus. Behar is about sacred economics. It is the priestly vision of the sacred society and the question of what is the role of money in a sacred society. And the Torah gives us institutions which were very difficult to carry out, but you could see what the intention was. The one is the Shemitah, where every seven years the fields lie fallow and the farmer sits down and everyone becomes, as it were, an equal in the culture. No one works for anyone else and all debts are canceled. And the other is the Yovel, which is even more radical. Every seven sevens, every 50th year, not only do we have a Shemitah in the 49th year, but in the 50th year, it's as if the entire economy winds, winds back to square one. Everyone pushes all their money into the middle of the board and everyone starts again with $200 and the hat or the shoe or whatever you started the game with. And everyone starts as an equal all over again. Now imagine that idea, by the way, that Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos push all their money in the middle and everyone in the country gets a share, an equal share of the entire wealth of the, of the nation. And we start again. And you could see that this is the priestly vision of a sacred society which had mechanisms, radical, radical mechanisms to prevent, to prevent systemic poverty, poverty that lasts one, two, three generations, because every 50th year, everything starts all over again. As well, this week on the Jewish calendar, we celebrate a very important day, the 33rd day of the Omer. Now, the Omer is that counting time between Passover and Shavuot. In the Torah story, it's our journey through the wilderness. Each day is counted, each week, and then six weeks. And after the, after the 49th day, the seventh, we have Shavuot. We have the seventh week in Shavuot. And, and each day is a, is a, is, has a sort of special ethos to it. The 33rd day, it's Lag, it's Lamed is 30 and Gimel is three, Lag Be'omer, is a day outside of the traditional observance of the Omer. The Omer is usually a day when we don't have celebrations, when we don't have happy occasions, you're not supposed to take haircuts and things like this. But the 33rd day is exceptional because it's the yard site. It is the annual day of the annual day of the commemoration of the life and the death of an extraordinary rabbi of the second century. His name is Shimon Bar Yochai. And Shimon Bar Yochai was the student of Rabbi Akiba. And he decreed upon his death that he wanted no one to mourn. He wanted instead a day of celebration. And so this becomes a very important day of celebration in the Jewish calendar. Now, this man, Shimon Bar Yochai, is very important because there is a story about him which, which recognizes a classic turning point in the history of the Jewish people. It's an important story. And the story takes place in the middle of the second century. Remember that the Romans destroyed the Holy Temple of Jerusalem in the year 70. The rabbis established an academy called Yavne in a town called Yavne, just on the coast. And then 50 years later in 120, there's a second revolt, the Bar Koch revolt against the Romans. This time the Romans came in in much more brutal way. They arrested Rabbi Akiba for the crime of teaching Torah, which they deemed a subversive act. And they murdered him in the most horrifying way in front of the public in the forum of Caesarea. And Shimon Bar Yochai, the student, he had to witness this. And he is scarred by it. And the story begins in Yavne, in the academy town, among the students of Rabbi Akiba. And the question they're asking is a very important question. I'll put the text up on the, on the, on the, on the screen. Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Yossi, Rabbi Shimon were sitting together and their student, Judah, happened to be there. And Rabbi Judah began the discussion by observing how noble are the works of this Roman nation. They laid out streets, they built bridges, they erected baths. So Rabbi Judah says, look, we live 
under the hegemony, under the power of this brutal Roman Empire. And we don't have anything to do with them culturally because their morality, their culture is brutality, is cruelty. But you have to give it to them that they're great engineers. They build great roads all over Europe are the roads that the Romans built. All over Europe and, and the Middle East are the, are the aqueducts that the Romans built, even in Israel itself. And Rabbi Yehuda says, isn't it interesting that this people, which is so cruel, so morally retrograde, has such power when it comes to engineering. And we can admire their engineering without participating in the culture of brutality. And that's the question. Can we selectively live in a majority culture and still preserve our own morality, our own identity? Rabbi Yossi was silent because he wasn't sure. He wasn't sure that you can live in the world with the Romans and not absorb their way of life. And Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, he rejects them. Remember, he's the one most deeply wounded by his teacher's death. All that they made, he says, they made to serve themselves, to worship themselves. There's no end to their cruelty. And you can't participate in any aspect of their culture without imbibing their poison. They lay out streets to settle prostitutes, baths to pamper themselves, and bridges to levy tolls. So the first question of our text is, can you participate as a Jew in a majority culture and take the best of that culture without imbibing its worst? I have a friend who sends his kid to a very orthodox day school, and as a condition of enrollment, you're not allowed to have a television in the house. Because the idea of the day school is that if you have a television, you'll imbibe the culture. And we don't want children breathing the cultural air of the culture outside of us. Mark, can we live in a majority culture selectively? Take the best of that culture without imbibing its moral poison? Well, the refutation of that belief, which I, I have a strange part of me that admires, frankly, but the refutation of that belief is a frumy day at Dodger Stadium. We also had it at Mets Stadium. So here are all these, these frumy guys. Frum means uh, the belief. That Very religiously observant people. Religiously, yeah. So the only, the only crack in the armor is these guys are baseball fanatics. <laughs> and the people who run the yeshivas said, look, you know, we can't keep it all out, but there's nothing in baseball. It's a completely self-contained game. It has none of the values of anything except the, val the game rules of the game. So let them listen to a baseball game. And so once a year, they have an Orthodox night at the stadium. I don't know what kosher they do. food, by the way. Yeah, I know. During the the seventh know. inning, you can seventh inning stretch. You can catch a mincha mariv minion on the loge deck. That's hilarious. That is hilarious. But here's so, the question. Yeah, that's yeah. the refutation of it. And then there's the the ser to be serious about it. Um, the the refutation of that world is what happens if your kid wants to be an engineer. They have to study Roman engineering because that was the state of the art of engineering at the time. What happens if your kid wants to be a doctor? You know, they have to study secular texts in medicine. Evolution, biology, evolutionary biology, yeah. which contradicts your sacred text. All of that. So it's, it's called by the, the, the general category in yeshiva, Limude Chol, which means secular studies, secular learning. So, yeah, it's one thing to not have a TV. I, I really do see the argument of not having a TV. I really do. Because most of it is junk that they're selling your kid. And your kids end up getting habituated into, I saw it and I want it. And I want it because I need it. Why do I need it? Because I saw it. Because I want it. Because I saw it. Because 
And it's this cycle of advertising and consumerism that is so destructive. You were very close to, to Professor Moshe Tendler of blessed memory. Very close. Tendler was one of the most important rabbinic authorities in America. And he was a professor of biology, of biological sciences at YU. Yes. So how did he live in two civilizations at the same time? He bifurcated his mind. He had patented genetically recombinant DNA research that he did. He had ba bacteria that he, that he invented, that he created. So I talked to him about this once. And I said, Moish, let me ask you, because your father-in-law was the greatest posek of our time, Rabbi Moshe Feinstein. He married Moshe Tendler, the Rosh Yeshiva of YU. He married uh, Feinstein's daughter. <clears throat> he said, your father-in-law knew that smoking caused cancer. And yet he refused to issue an isur against smoke, a, a prohibition against uh, smoking for all the yeshivas that were part of his tradition, the misnagdisha tradition, the yeshivish world. Right. He refused to issue a proclamation which could have saved thousands and thousands of lives. Because one of the things when I was studying in Mir Yeshiva for a while, one of the things that was so funny to me is that the guys would, on Shabbos, they would, they would come out and sit on the steps outside with a cigarette that they wanted to light up, but they couldn't light a match because it was Shabbos, so they would wait for someone who wasn't Jewish, smoking, which wasn't hard in Israel at that time. And it's like, hey, boy, no. And they, they'd say, they'd give me a contact light. And so, you know, they, they, they still couldn't get rid of it. So I said, much why? And he says, because my father-in-law once said to me about it, it is a mitzvah to teach what can be learned. It is also a mitzvah not to teach what cannot be learned. Mm. And I was at first offended by that because I said, what kind of cowardice? This is the man on the pinnacle of the rabbinic yeshiva world. And he doesn't have the courage to to use that authority to save lives, which are clearly, it's clearly required by the law of pikuach nefesh and v'chai bahem and v'nish martemod et nafshatechem, guard your soul, live by the commandments, all, there's a hundred verses of why you should live a healthful life. And he wouldn't do it. So what we learn here, and this is why I love the Rambam, the Maimonides, what we learn is that there has never been a Judaism that had any value, that did not take seriously what the outside world was learning about the world and about humankind. Mm -hmm. And that is a commitment, which may be the single most important commitment differentiating all the liberal Jewish forms from ultra-Orthodoxy. We believe that the outside world is not just full of narishkeit, of stupidity, that it isn't just full of, you know, pornography and, and moral degradation, that it's also full of extraordinary genius in the work that God wants us to do, the work of healing, for example. And in order to be a part of that, we have to be engaged in it. Now, you ask yourself, 
What does it tell us? That the part of Judaism, which arguably is the most fervent and observant, is also the most hostile to the best of the modern world. What does that tell us? To me, it tells me they guessed wrong. They made the wrong choice. They had one good point, which is let's protect our kinder from the worst of outside world stuff, but let's let them be open to the parts of the world that God wanted there to be, that, that God wants, that God encourages works of healing and innovation and labor saving and works that get women out of the kitchen and get them into more productive work and, and that they want to do, not that the kitchen isn't productive. But these things, the innovations of the modern world that are good, we want to take cognizance of, just like Maimonides took cognizance of Neoplatonized Aristotelianism. He understood that at that view of the world with 10 spheres and the world at the middle with the, the sphere of the moon and then the planets and then God is the unmoved mover above the 10th rotating sphere. He believed that was true because everyone in the world believed that was true. So it's a complicated thing. How much of the world do you let in without it destroying your core beliefs? Mm -hmm. And how much of the world do you keep out to protect yourself from the cultural predations of a world that does not share your values? And let us all say amen. Please well, the, rise. The text we're looking at, this text is exactly that question. Yes. And, and Rabbi Gelman has anticipated where the text might go. So the three rabbis are asking themselves precisely the same question, and this is in the second century. They're looking at a brutal Roman Empire, and they're asking, is there anything in that culture that we can selectively assimilate, selectively participate in, without imbibing the cultural brutality or the culture of brutality that Rome represents? Rabbi Yehuda says their architecture, their science, their technology can be assimilated without taking in the moral poison. Rabbi Yossi, who has also witnessed the destruction that the Romans wrought, wasn't so sure. And Rabbi Shimon, as, as the rabbi, as rabbi Gelman has pointed out, Rabbi Shimon says, no, you can't take any of it. So what happens is this, this Judah, who's the student, goes and tells these things until they're heard by the government. And the government offers a decree. Judah, who acclaimed us, shall be acclaimed. So he becomes the Nasi. Yossi, who remains silent, or the head of the Jewish community. Yossi, who remains silent, shall be exiled to Sepphoris, which is a Sipori, which is a village in the, in the north of Israel. And Shimon, who vilified us, shall be put to death. They put a contract out on his life, because much like his teacher, Rabbi, Shim, Rabbi Akiba, they see him as a subversive element. As a result, Rabbi Shimon and his son go and hide out in the house of study, where every day Rabbi Shimon's wife would bring him a bread and a jug of water, with which they sustained themselves. So now, the, so the image is the rabbi is running away from Roman police. Where does he go? He runs to the base midrash, like he goes to the synagogue, like that's the last place a rabbi would go. But do you understand what he's doing here? He's not really afraid of the Romans, as in, in the Roman police. He's afraid of the Roman culture, and so he's more concerned for the fate of his soul than the fate of his body. And he goes to the one place where he knows his soul is secure, the one place that is pure of any Roman influence, the one place where Torah reigns, and that's the synagogue. But he still has a body. He is still a body in space. He still has to eat and drink. And so his wife is his sort of umbilical cord. The wife brings him bread and water. But he recognizes there's a problem with that. And he says, Women's resolution is frail. Your mother put to the torture may reveal the place we're hiding. So he's not a feminist, that's for sure. They went and they hid in a cave and a miracle occurred. A carob tree and a well were created for them. So a miracle occurs, indicates that maybe God is in favor of this sort of thing. That God is, 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 is letting him be in the cave. 
And the interesting image of the cave, now what can a cave represent, right? A cave can be a grave. It's where you go to die. A cave can be the womb. It's the place of birth. Rabbi Gilman referenced Plato. In Plato, the cave is the place of the shadows and the philosopher is the one who can climb out and see the truth in the sunlight. Here, for Rabbi Shimon, the cave is a place of refuge from the brutality of the Roman culture, and he remains in the cave. And the image is brilliant. Look at the next line. They would remove their garments and sit up to their necks in sand and study the entire day. And when it was time to pray, they put on their garments, wrapped themselves in their prayer shawls and their talisim, and they prayed, and they removed their garments again, and they stayed 12 years in the cave. So if you walked in the cave, what do you see? Two talking heads. Two talking heads. So what you have here is if I can't live in the world that the Romans occupy and rule, what's left me? Simply the life of the mind. Simply the life of the mind. And the question is, is Judaism a faith of the mind alone? Can you be a Judaism as a, a Jew, as a talking head? Because that's what Rabbi Shimon wants. And what it represents is something that you call in English monasticism. What is a monastery? It's a place where you can go and live a holy life separate and apart and isolated from the routines and the demands and the challenges of the world outside. And the question here is, is that the way we should live as Jews? Should we live separate from the world outside because the world outside is threatening, if not the body, certainly the soul? Or do we engage that world and take upon ourselves the chance that that world might actually get to us, but we also have a chance to change that world, to engage that world. And that's the question at the heart of this text. Rabbi Shimon believes, I can't live in the world with these Romans. I'm going to run to my cave, and there I'm going to be a true Jew. Well, he does this for 12 years. And after 12 years, a voice comes, uh, Elijah comes and says, Caesar is dead, and the contract on your life has been annulled. So they went out, Rabbi Shimon and his son, and they see people plowing and sowing, you know, making a living. And Rabbi Shimon exclaims, these men forsake life eternal and engage in life temporal. And whatever they cast their eyes on was immediately incinerated. God comes and says, have you come out to destroy my world? Return to your cave. Listen to the oppositions there, right? Rabbi Shimon sees people making a living. And he says, you have a choice. You can either live for the soul or for the body. You can either live the eternal life or the bodily life. But you can't live both. These people are living the life of the body. They have forsaken their souls. And he becomes judgmental to the extreme. And the image, it's a great image, by the way, of judgmentalism, is that everything he looks at is disintegrated. If you have a teenager in your life and the kid looks at you and rolls their eyes and goes, whatever, that's exactly the, the image. And God comes and says, have you come to destroy my world? Return to your cave. And that's the important line, because my world is the world where people make a living. My world is a world where people engage with life. Your world is the pure world of the mind. That's not my world, says God. So Rabbi Shimon and his son go in back into the cave for another year. And at the end of that year, they come out again. And what happens is they walk the world and they decide Rabbi Shimon is now healed. He is more mollified. His son is still this crazy radical. And Rabbi Shimon says, no, don't kill anybody. Whatever happens, you and I have enough Torah to fill this world. So what happens is he is more adjusted to the world. His son is not. But the idea that God says to them, leave your cave, leave your cave, this line here, that is the moment that Judaism decided not to be a monastic faith. We would live in the world. We'd make a living. We'd learn science and medicine and live in the world and find holiness within the real world. And then it has a beautiful ending. And the ending is they see this old guy running around with these branches and they stop him and they say, what are you doing? And he says, it's for Shabbos. It's for Shabbat. 
And they say, you need two? What is one should be enough? And he says, no, there's two commandments for the Shabbat, one in Exodus and one in Deuteronomy. And so each bundle of fragrant, fragrant leaves is for one of those commandments. And Rabbi Shimon says, see how precious the commandments are to Israel. So the life of the commandments and the life of the Shabbat, that's the answer that the text gives us. The commandments means a commandment is a holy act you do, but with your body in the world. And the Shabbat means that you can live in the cave, but only one day a week. The rest of the days of the week, you got to live in the world. And the great question is, can you live in the world without losing your soul? Please. That's so beautiful. And, and it's a wonderful passage and a, a central passage in the history of the birth of Judaism. First, let me point to my own little passion, the Olam Haba. He says the life you're going to give up, Olam Haba, then what, 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 what is it anything worth if you give up Olam Haba? So that's want to make note of that. But the other thing I would bring up as the sort of interfaith guy here, and that is, I would bring up Buddhism and Catholicism, right? So those two among several religious traditions, uh, interestingly, not Islam and not Judaism, but those two came to the story. They didn't have the story, but they came to the same question. Can you live in the world and still practice the religion? And they came to the decision of early Shimon Bar Yochai. Said, no, you have to stay in the cave. And that's why real Buddhism is practiced by what's called the Sangha, which is the association of Buddhist priests. Um, they're called bhikkhus. And they have nuns, they have female priests who are called bhikkhunis. So the bhikkhus and bhikkhunis make up the Sangha, the holy order of Buddhist monks, and they're celibate and vegetarian. And they, and they own nothing and they live by begging and they have one bowl and that's all they have. And that ascetic life is the life the Buddha lived when he gained, he gained Nibbana enlightenment under the Bodhi tree. So they choose a clerical faith. And Buddhism, of course, isn't just monks and bhikkhus and bhikkhunis. There is what they call householders. Householders are regular people who are Buddhist. And they make livings and they go out of the cave. But it's quite clear that the real Buddhism is the Buddhism of the Sangha. Mm. The second religion that made the same choice of early Shimon Bar Yochai is Catholicism. Because they decided we're going to have celibate priests and they are the ones who are really going to be the symbolic exemplars of Catholicism. Mm -hmm. You know, the billions and billions of Catholics in the world, that's fine, that's good, but they aren't the real thing. The real thing are the, the priests. And with Tommy Hartman, I would see this all the time. People would look to him in a totally different way, and for good reason. I mean, this isn't just a story, Eddie. We lived this for 30 years. You know, people would come up, they would say, and I would talk to him, we would talk. I'd say, Tommy, I understand why people revere you. They admire me, they're impressed by me, they're in, in awe of me. Most people were in awe of me. That's why we're friends. You've never been in awe of me. <laughs> I love you. I love you. I'm going to be in awe of you. I know. But I know, well yes, I know why they revere you, Tommy. Because you have given up a career where you could make a lot of money. And you have given up sex. You've given up a family. You've given up everything that people basically work for. And you've given it all to God, all to the church. I think his salary as a monsignor, he said, hey, Mark, I just got a raise. 
<laughs> of eight thousand dollars i now make twenty five thousand dollars a year hmm. and out of that twenty five thousand he had to pay for auto insurance and uh, a bunch of stuff and you know so and people looked at me and i was you know a fancy suburban rabbi and let's just say it in a gentle way i wasn't exactly the symbol of sacrifice and i understood that and i felt would you say did i feel guilty about that i think to say it in a simple way the answer is yes i did because there is a way of serving god in the cave that is unambiguous you are serving God. You have no distractions. When I was studying in yeshiva, it was beautiful, except that all their beliefs were askew and their culture was askew. And it created a lot of human distortions when yeshiva guys didn't have enough money to get married, so they hung around in yeshiva and they got into some bad habits. <laughs> but there was something about renouncing everything for God. It was the spirit of sacrifice. That, you know, it's easy for us to make fun of the Sunday televangelists when and they had their big fall with the, the, the people who I don't even want to embarrass them by saying that. You know, I would say, you know, it's easy to say, oh, they were just exploitative con, con artists. But the truth of the matter is, this, this cuts against us, Eddie. It cuts against us. I mean, if, if you're really serving God, what are you doing with a family? What are you doing with a big salary? What are you doing with all this stuff? So there's an argument to be made here. Yes, it's true. If you go in the cave, you don't learn how to create penicillin. You don't learn how to create, you know, the iPhone. But I don't know. There's something when you meet the Dalai Lama, you see it. When you met Mother Teresa, you saw it. There's something incredibly noble about living a life of sacrifice. Yeah, I, I can understand living a life of sacrificing material comforts and wealth, that I understand. I have to say for myself, maybe you've had the same experience, that I've learned more about spirituality from being a father and a husband than I would have, that I learned from all the books that ever taught me anything. That, that the experience of, of, of living with a family, raising a family, being with a family, the patience, the understanding, the forgiveness, the communication that one has to develop within a family, that's where, that's, that's my spirituality. And I think yes. I would have lost something, not to in any way insult someone like Father Hartman, but I, I, I personally would have, would have been unable to have been a rabbi if I had not been a husband and a father and a friend and engage with people in the way that I did. So the cave for me would not have worked. Maybe for other people it does. And and in terms No, of you're right. And I, I I appreciate that and I I believe you. And and I have had that same experience uh being a father and a husband. I I have. However, I would say this There was a night my seven-year-old son, Max, saw me walking out the front door to go to the synagogue. And he said, Daddy, do you really have to go? Of course. I, I want you to stay home with me and read me stories. Mm -hmm. I want you to be with me. And I said, no, I can't stay with you tonight. I have to go out. And Tommy never had that. Right. He never had to choose between right. his son and his priesthood. And he never would be able to speak to those of us who do. And everyone has to make those choices. 
And the fact that you and I had to make those choices made us doubly sensitive to the anguished choices of other people who have to choose between parts of their lives which they value infinitely, between, their, between the demands of a career on the one hand and the demands of family and, and the world on the other. Yes, that's what life is in this moment. And those moments gave us an exquisite sensitivity to that and an ability at least to, if not to answer the question, at least to be able to address the question when those in my community ask me, what choices do I make? How do I make these choices? Yeah, I, I I agree. I agree. I'm gonna vo I'm gonna vote for family in this one. Thank you. Well, me I too. Appreciate, I appreciate what you said. No, no, I'm not in any. You're exactly right. Those who gave a hundred percent to the life of faith do have a certain amazing experience. Experience I can't even begin to imagine. But I have to say that for me, the life in the world taught me a great deal about spirituality. Well, I, and I I think that's wonderful and true. But other things are also true. And one of the other things that's true is sometimes we delude ourselves, not that you would, because you're, you, you can't see this because you're a holy guy, you're a tzaddik. But I'm not a tzaddik, so I can see these things. And that's this. You have a choice. You could live like Tommy lived in a dorm room where basically he had a little refrigerator with some tuna fish sandwiches put there by some woman who used to put tuna fish sandwiches in his little refrigerator. And that's your life. Or you can ha live large and with a, with a comfortable salary and live in the world and do what you want. Now, if you tell me, no, I don't, I'm going to reject the tuna fish sandwich because I learned so much from being a father. That's great. But it, you know it's also true that some people reject the tuna fish sandwiches because they're going for the money. I know, I know. And, and so these things are more complicated. Not Absolutely. you, they're not complicated because you're at Sadiq. Your motivation was always and is always to do the good and to learn the most that you can learn. I have that in me too, but it also struggles. And, and I think the end of the text, I want to finish the text. Yeah. The end of the text, Shimon Bar Yochai says to his son, I understand your rage at the world and your desire to retreat to the world of the mind and the heart and the cave, uh, but the world needs us and you and I will be enough. And there, there, is, there is a recognition of what you're saying there, Mark. He's never fully... He's never fully reconciled to living in the world because of the trauma of seeing his teacher destroyed, because of the holiness that comes from withdrawal. You're exactly right. And there is a recognition of that, of that, of that not finishing the argument. The, the text is unfinished at the end. It has a, an unfinished quality. It does, doesn't what it? What you're saying is exactly right. So today, today is, the, uh, is two days past Lagba Omer. It's a Lamed Heba Omer, Laba Omer, as they'd say. Uh, it's not a holiday, but two days ago, we celebrated the yard site of Shimon Bar Yochai. And these questions of living in the world and living according to the rules of the heart and struggling with the world at the same time to bring holiness to the world, that's what we are today. Let me wish you a very good Shabbos, Mark. Good Shabbos, my friend. And everyone listening, following this, of course, we have uh, services from Valley Beth Shalom. You're welcome to stay on and enjoy. Our, our prayer services uh, tonight at six o'clock, every morning, uh, tomorrow morning at 8.30 and six o'clock and every morning at 7.30 and six o'clock. Please join us. And we want to wish you a very, very, very pleasant Shabbat. Enjoy the beautiful springtime outside. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom.